Our Father in heaven, we come to thee in prayer. We're very thankful for this day and the loving kindness. Thank thee, Father, for allowing us to be here tonight. Thank thee for allowing us to, our lives to be shared and spared throughout this time. We ask thee to be with those that are sick and those that have had troubles and surgeries. We pray they may do better in days to come and we may be able to give them strength in some way. Help us to always, Father, to help one another throughout life, especially our family of God. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive others of their sins against us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We've been studying about attitude and what our attitude is toward truth. This has been our first session, and Lord willing, we'll finish this session tonight. We'll have other things to talk about about our attitude, but everybody in life has an attitude about something has an idea about something, has an opinion about something. And a lot of times we express our opinions and our ideas, our attitudes, and what we say in life sometimes can make a difference in somebody else's life. Let them know what we're going through. But an attitude of truth that we ought to have is, is truth will help us if we'll put on the right armor. The Bible talks about putting on the armor of God. I'm going to look at Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 10 in just a few minutes. Now understand, friends, this is, these are verses that we've heard in our course of our lives. We've heard them in sermons. We've heard them in classes. We've even read these words ourselves. And let us always understand that these words are given that we might be benefited in our life to make our life stronger. Because we are responsible for making our life better and having a good outlook on life. If we have that good outlook, then our lives can be a lot better. But we look at Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong with the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, I love what it says in verse 11. Because you can stand against the devil if you'll stand as Jesus Christ has said. Remember back whenever Jesus Christ was tempted? on three occasions out of the wilderness. And on these three occasions, there were three words that Jesus said on each occasion. Anybody remember what those words were? It is written. So everything is written within the word of God that you and I need to overcome sin and to overcome Satan. But then he said, for we we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to, stand, to able to stand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Now, something in this, in this verse, <coughs> give me something in this verse twelve that is very important to me, and I want us to recognize and understand that. <coughs> excuse me. He said, "We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, friends. Whenever sin is attacked in the life of somebody." Don't attack the person. Attack the sin. Too many times in our lives we we put people down because they've sinned. But they need help. They need encouragement. And they need our strength that we can give them. So this verse here that he explains about wrestling against things of this world. Realize that we're fighting the battle against sin every day. Because sin is rampant. Sin is raging everywhere we turn and everywhere we go. So let's recognize the importance of trying to defeat sin, especially in our own lives. If I defeat sin in my life, then I can help somebody else defeat sin in their life. But I've got to defeat it on the basis of that I'm striving to serve God better every day. Verse 14, it says, Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, we've been talking about our attitude toward truth. Within the Word of God, you and I find the Scriptures give us everything we need for survival spiritually. We learn things in life about surviving physically. But this book, to me, is the most important thing that man needs because we need to survive spiritually. We need to serve God well. So I need to guard myself with this truth right here. Now, whenever I was growing up, whenever I was in Bible classes... I had to remember a lot of verses. And I'm talking about from the very first time that I went to little classes as a child. 
We had to memorize things. Did y'all ever do that? Had to memorize Bible verses. Had to memorize books of the Bible. Had to memorize Bible characters. All of these were very essential, and they're still very essential. Because today, those who are children of God and those who have served God well in their lives still rely upon what they were taught and learned when they were young. Because the things that they're taught when they were young sticks with them the rest of their lives. That's why that I want to say to you that I appreciate if you bring young children to church, if you bring them to Bible class, you give them an opportunity that is not afforded to a lot of children in the world today. You give them the ability to learn and to know what God is and who God is. And so thereby we must understand that if they grow up with this, it makes it a lot better. It makes it a lot simpler. That's correct. That's it. But you know, but you know we don't find that a lot. Because this, this is everywhere you look. You hear it, you hear it on the radio, you, you see it on TV, you read it in the paper, and you read what do you read about most and hear most about? Sin. Sinful things. Now if children are only taught those things that they hear and see in those bases. It's just like at church, how many hours, if you come to every service, how much time do you spend here in worship? Four hours a week. How many hours are there in a week? 168. Now, I've often questioned myself, am I giving God enough of my time if I spend only four hours in worship? Now, if I spend time outside this worship service studying the Word of God and learning more about God's Word, then I'm benefiting myself because... I'm doing what a lot of people never do. That's why, friends, let's understand that we need to gird ourselves and guard ourselves in our lives and make sure we are strong within God as we stand every day. So the question is, as I begin this lesson, what is my attitude toward truth? Do I want to learn it? Do I want to understand it? Or do I want to cast it aside? But then he also says, in your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I love that he taught, calls this the gospel of peace because it brings peace. And the basis that we need to understand is that when it talks about bringing this peace, it's not just necessarily peace between men. It's talking about peace with God, peace with Christ, peace with the Spirit, and peace within ourselves. Do you realize how many people today in our world battle, a wage a battle within themselves? There's a battle that is fought sometimes every single day as to whether or not they're going to serve God. But friends, we must be victorious in this battle. We must realize that I'm in charge of that. You see, there are three votes that are taken. You can either be for God or you can be for sin or you can be for yourself. So which one am I for? Am I going to be for God? Now, the idea of man is that we want to be for self. But Jesus Christ made it very plain about seeking self and putting ourself above God. We've got to be careful on that. Because God must come first. So I need my feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Remember over there in, in the book of Romans where it says that beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel? Now I don't have beautiful feet. But that means those who go and preach and those who go and teach and those who live with these things, friends, are beautiful to God because they're doing what God asks. And this must be done on a daily basis. Not one day a week. Not one hour a week. Not even four hours a week. But I've got to live on this basis that I've got to have this gospel prepared for me and within me everywhere that I go. Because I need this gospel. He then says, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You see, friends, the idea of man is that we can prepare ourselves with the Word of God if we want to. But we need to realize that he talks about quenching the fiery darts of the wicked one. Who is the wicked one? The devil. We don't want the devil to defeat us. We don't want him to let him get us. 
Several years ago, whenever I was teaching, when I was teaching young people, when I was teaching children, I had a little boy that come to my class that was rambunctious. He was, I never knew, I never knew if he was paying attention or not. But I just kept teaching as I normally did. This young man came to class one day and he handed me a piece of paper. And I took this piece of paper and unfolded it and he had a picture of what he thought the devil looked like. And he had wrote at the bottom of the paper, don't let him get you. And I thought, well, maybe something did go across to this young man. But don't ever pass up an opportunity to learn yourself. Don't ever pass up a chance to teach somebody else, especially a child. Because friends, people today need to know that they need this word of God. The devil is out to get man and he wants to defeat him. And he says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. <clears throat> helmet of salvation. We need, friends, we need that helmet. Now, we talk about getting, how do you get salvation? Anybody tell me how you get salvation? Do, do what now? Obeying the gospel. If we obey the gospel, then we can have salvation in our hand. Friends, don't turn it loose. It says you can be saved if you'll obey the gospel. But too many times people turn it loose and don't hold on to it. But we need to hold on to the word of God and allow that word to penetrate us and to make our life rich and full. So you and I must know and understand that in the course of our days, let's realize that we can take this gospel and we can make our, our lives better. He says, you take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is the sword. This is a sword, the Scripture says in the book of Hebrews, that is sharper, this Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. What does that mean? It can penetrate you. It can get next to your heart. If you'll allow this Word of God to work within you and make you what you are to be. But also, you can take this Word of God and you can teach your fellow man do you realize how many people that are religious people that don't know this book? Are you aware of how many there are in our world that we know that claim to be church-going people that don't know this book right here? Friends, we need to know this book. We need to learn it. We need to understand it. And we need to allow it to direct every step we take. But then he said, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for this, all saints. Friends, he talk, uses a word there that's used a lot in the life and a word I'm going to use in just a minute. He uses the word watch. You know, we watch, we watch other people. You know, I have a friend that, that used to go pick up his wife at work and he would have to sit out on the street and wait for her to get off work for him to, her to come to the car. And he told me one time, he says, you know, Colin, when people, when people don't realize you're watching them, they do the strangest things. And that's true. They do. And the idea of man to understand is that our purpose is not, is not to watch other people on the basis of looking to see how, what they're doing. But the idea of man of watching here to me means that we watch our lives. And we watch what our life does. So I will ask you a question. What year are we in? What's this year? 2022. When you started 2022, you were at a certain level as a child of God. Do you believe me? We must understand that we are all at a certain level anytime, anywhere that we live in this world. So the question is that we need to sometimes ask ourselves is, am I as strong a Christian now as I was at the first of the year? Am I stronger? Have I learned? Have I gained more knowledge? Have I gained more understanding? My thought in mind is this, friends, that if I don't gain knowledge as I go through this life, I'm defeating myself. Because I need to know the Word of God. So you watch your life. Next scripture I want to refer to is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I'm going to read verses 5 through 13. And in these verses, we're going to learn what the Apostle Paul told the Thessalonian people about watching. And watching what we do and what we say and, and what we, where our life is. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 5. He says, Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. Ye are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and hope, for in heaven, the hope of salvation. Again, Paul, just like he talked to the Ephesian people, he talked to them about this, this hope. And he talked to them about this helmet. And I need to keep this helmet with me because I, I need this protection. But the idea of man that we gather within this verse is, he says, you watch. Watch where your life goes. You know, sometimes, and I'm sure that some of you in here have probably done this in time past. If any of you ever lived around a creek, have you ever in your life, when you were younger, took something and threw it in the creek and watched it float down? Maybe throw rocks at it, see if you could hit it. But that, whatever you throw in the water would just, just drift, slowly drift away. And that's why that every child of God needs to watch our lives because, friends, you can be drifting, you can be drifting and not even realize it till you're somewhere you don't want to be. So you watch your life. You watch where it's going. And you watch, you watch your strength. But this hope of salvation that I have, I have in Jesus Christ. Verse 9, it says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. You notice he uses the word there in that verse, obtain. What does it mean to obtain? Anybody tell me what it means to obtain? Get it. You got to get it. And that's why you take the Word of God and you look through this Word of God and see, you see what God wants because you've got to get what the Bible says. You've got to get it within your mind and let it be firm and let it be planted within your, in your heart. Because this Word of God can be planted within your heart. But you've got to let it be planted. And you've got to fertilize it. You know how it is with the garden. You've got to fertilize it. You've got to water it. And as dry as it's been, you've got to keep watering something, hadn't you, for it to flourish. The idea of man is that you and I need to water our lives as a Christian. And how do you water your life as a Christian? You feed it the Word of God. But what was it Paul said? I planted. Apollos watered. God gave the increase. So he says, now Paul planted, but I watered it. What, is it, what did it mean he watered it? He kept on teaching it. He kept on enforcing it. He kept on, you know, pushing it on forward. And that's what we've got to do with our life, friend. It don't, it don't happen automatic unless we help it. The Word of God is there to benefit us in our lives. Are we going to allow the Word of God to not help us? We can obtain the truth. We can obtain the gospel. We can obtain salvation. And we do this through, who do we do this through? Through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ that wrote the book on salvation. Then it says, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as, ye, as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them that which labor among you and are over you in the, in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now understand, realize, that, realize a word that I want you to notice in verse 12. The Apostle Paul says, beseech. What does it mean to beseech? Beg. He said, I'm begging you. I'm begging you by the gospel. I'm begging you by the words of Jesus Christ. You make your life strong. You make your life full. Don't, don't ever back up. That's why that I love some of my favorite verses in the Bible. And one of those favorite verses in Romans chapter 12 beginning in verses 1 and 2. Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, with the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. He says, I'm begging you. I'm begging you, you be a living sacrifice. Let people see Christ in you. Let people hear the words of Christ out of your mouth. You say, well, I don't go around quoting Bible, but you do go around saying words. And the words we say, friends, are very, very important because we're either teaching bad or we're teaching good. So which one do I want to teach? 
Then in verse 2 of Romans 12, he says, And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Don't live like the world lives. You be changed by the blood of Christ. You be changed by what the Bible teaches. You allow your life to go in the direction that God wants you to go. Don't ever, don't ever back up. Don't ever quit. You keep on serving God throughout the course of your days because God will help you. But a key word is the word watch. Don't miss that word. Likewise, we turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 through 14. And I want you to notice in these verses of what the Apostle Paul talks about of how there are those that are working to deceive you. Do you know there are people today in the world that don't want you to know the Word of God? Do you know there are people in the world today that don't want you to go to church? They don't want you to be a Christian? So whatever you do with your life, don't you ever allow somebody to deceive you. You stand your ground. You stand firm. That's why we notice the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only who now, now letteth, will let, until he be taken out of the way. And, when, and, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. You know, whenever they talk about Satan a whole lot, they use the word lying. Satan is a liar. Satan is the father of lies. And Satan works his devices through mankind to allow mankind to believe lies. Just like many today in our world are being taught contrary to what this book teaches. Oh, they firm, they base their teachings on these ideas right here. But they twist them and they turn them and make them mean what Satan wants them to mean. Because he wants to lead people astray. He wants, he wants people to get to judgment someday and the Lord say, depart from me, I never knew you. That's what he wants. He wants man to be defeated on every cause and every form and every fashion. But we can be saved if we'll obey the truth. Then he says, and with all deceitfulness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Oh, how many are being deceived today. How many are being mistaught? How many friends in our world today are being led astray because they won't listen to what the Word actually teaches? And the thought of man to understand is a phrase that I have heard time and time again. And you probably heard the same phrase. <clears throat> Let me ask my preacher. Friends, I shouldn't have to ask my preacher. I ought to be able to turn to the Word of God because there are many things in here that are very beneficial because this book, friends, explains itself if we'll just simply obey it. If we'll just simply study this book and learn it. There are many things in here to learn and many things to know. Mankind must not be deceived. We must not be misled. We must stand our ground. Make sure that what you believe, that's why the Scripture says, make your calling and election sure, doesn't it? Make sure that what you follow is after the plan of God. Then it says that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. What does it mean to be damned? That's a word that's in the Bible. That mankind can be damned. Why? Because he believes a lie. Because he doesn't follow Jesus as Jesus teaches. He doesn't follow the word of God. And he ruins his own life. Friends, we don't want to ruin our own life. We don't want to defeat our purpose. He said, but we, but we are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you. Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. God has chosen you. The Bible says God wants all men what? He wants all men saved. God doesn't want anybody to be lost. You think it hurts God when man goes against him? You think that God is up there going, why? Why won't they listen? 
And Jesus Christ that gave his life on the cross of Calvary for the sins of man. You ever wonder, why? Why did they not listen to me? Why did they not do this? But Jesus knows. They wouldn't listen to him when he was living. They wouldn't believe in him when they was living. And it talks about some of those that wanted to believe, but they were afraid to because they'd be rejected. They'd be put out of the synagogue. Friends, understand that if you serve God, God's not going to push you out. If you live by his will, no matter what man does or says, you can't be defeated if you want to serve God. We must not let man defeat us. We must not be deceived under any conditions because God will help us. He then says in verse 14, Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're called by what? What do you say you're called by? Gospel. Does anybody, anybody in the world that's ever called any different than this from this right here? No. No, friends, this, this is the only thing that calls mankind to salvation. And God does not call you individually. Even though I've heard that many times. God came to me and called me in person. He doesn't do that. Because God gave this gospel right here. And he expects every person to obey this gospel. Every human being. Friends, if we can't obey this right here, what else is left for us? There's nothing in this world. The Bible talks about the making of, making of books. There is no end. And there have been millions upon millions upon millions of books that have been written in time and history. There have been millions and millions of books that have been written on the idea of salvation. But there is no book that will compare. No book that is equal to this book right here. <clears throat> Any book you read is an idea of man. And that's why we've got to understand, am I going to obey God or am I going to obey man? Which one? Any comments or questions at this point? An important thing for every child of God, stay within the doctrine. Stay within the Lord. If you are away from the Lord, the Lord don't move. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The only reason that I would be away from the Lord is that I've been led away. I have allowed myself to be defeated. That's why that I've got to realize that I've got to come to Jesus. Why do you think he said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You see, friends, Jesus Christ says, come to him. You come to him if you want to know the truth. Don't go to anybody else. If you want to understand what Jesus Christ says, you turn to his word and see what Jesus Christ says on the matter. Because this is where salvation is found. So can I, can I stand the ground? Can I stand firm? I want to look over at the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 6. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 1 in just a few minutes. 1 Timothy, chapter 6, and beginning in verse 1. The scripture talking about here about mankind, where he needs to stay, and how firm he needs to stand. He said, Let, let as many servants as are under the yoke count your own, their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, <clears throat> despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are, they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit, things which teach and exhort. If any man teach you otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, if anybody teaches anything else, if anybody goes contrary to what Jesus Christ gave, he explains in verse 4, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words. Whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, and evil surmising. Perverse, disputing, <coughs> excuse me, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. 
Supposing that, God, that, that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. <coughs> from such withdraw thyself. You know, sometimes in life we, we gain a lot of things. Everything that I've ever had, God blessed me with that. Oh, but you weren't. But God blessed me to work. God blessed me with everything that I've been given. And that's why that you and I must realize that sometimes in life, there are those friends that think that because I'm gaining, because I'm getting this, and because I'm getting that, that, that I'm doing okay. Our main objective in life is not to get the world's goods. Our main objective in life is to serve God. And the idea of man of too many are destitute of the truth. What does that mean? Destitute of the truth. They don't have it. This, this, is, this is no longer important to them. Many say, well, I learned this when I was young. That's good. I memorized this when I was young. That's good. But have you retained it? Have you kept, have you kept in your mind and your heart what you've learned? You know, I love and sometimes when I'm just sitting and <clears throat> resting a while. <clears throat> excuse me. When I'm sitting and just resting a while, I love to rehearse things that I know out of the Bible. I love to rehearse things that I've learned throughout the course of my days because it does me good. It helps me, friends, to know this truth. It helps me to establish this truth within my heart and make myself stronger because I gain, I gain this word. You see, you can learn new things, but don't ever forget the old. Don't ever forget what you learned as a youngster, you learned as a teenager, as you learned growing up. Don't ever forget that. Because we need to retain these things. They need to benefit us in our lives. If they don't benefit us, then where is our life? He said that godliness with contentment is a great gain. Are you a happy person? Are you content with what you have? Do you ever grumble? Do you ever gripe? Do you ever complain about what you don't have? You know, sometimes in this life, we do that sometimes because we don't have this or have that. Friend, that's, that's not what we need. We need to be thankful for what God's given us. What we've been blessed with. Too many times we, we forget that because in the hustle bustle of the world, we think that I'm really gaining something. But what am I gaining? Because the time that you and I spend in our worship to God, the time that you and I spend in learning about God and making our life stronger with Him, the better off we are because that enriches us. Did you read the Bible today? Have you read the Bible every day this week? Have you studied something? Have you learned, have you learned anything new? I have. I learn something most every day when I get into God's Word. And I learn things that I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, why didn't I see that before? Because the Word of God is so rich and full of treasure. And I need, and I need this treasure. Then it says in verse 7, and I love this verse right here. For we brought nothing into this world. And it is certain we can carry nothing out. You know, sometimes in life, friends, we, we, we amass a lot in this life. And God blesses us with that. God gives us a lot of things to be happy with and to enjoy. But don't let that be the mainstay of your life. Because just like he says, you brought nothing when you came and you're carrying nothing out. You see, friends, too many times in our lives, you know, we think about all of this and just like the rich man said, I'm going to tear down my barn and I'm going to build bigger barns. What are you going to do that for? What are you going to do with all of this? Leave it for your kids to fight over? Leave it for your kids to wonder what they're going to do with it? You see, the, friends, the whole idea in mind is that you're, not, that you're not carrying nothing with you. So what, what am I doing? Am I serving God? Am I directing my life as, as it should be directed? Heard the story one time of a man that was getting ready to die. And he told his wife, said, Hon, I want you to get this and I want you to get that. And he named off a bunch of stuff I want, wanted her to get. And I want you to take it all up and I want you to put it up in the attic. What do you want me to put it in the attic for? 
I'm going to get it on the way up when I die. She went up and put it in the attic just like he asked. So just as quick as she died, she went running up in the attic to see if it was there, and it was all still there. And she made the comment, I knew he should have put it in the basement. Now, that'd be pretty bad, wouldn't it? That'd be, that'd be pretty bad. But the idea of mine to understand is that you and I know our lives can be rich if we'll just simply serve God. This says, verse 9, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and the many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Nothing wrong with money. Nothing wrong with having money. God wants us to have it. He wants us to be able to use it. But he talks about the love of money. It will not sustain your life because when your life comes to an end, everything's still going to be here. Are we laying up treasure with God? We lay up treasure with God by serving him well every day. We lay up treasure with God by giving our life to him on every facet of our life and what we do. Realize, friends, that you and I, in the course of our life, can have a better life and a richer life if we just simply serve God. He said, But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. That verse 11 and 12 are two verses that I wish everybody would study. And I wish you would take those two verses and I wish you'd meditate upon them. And think about what those, those words mean in these verses. What does it say to follow after? Righteousness. You see, friends, Jesus Christ said in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for what? They shall be filled. We need to be filled with righteousness. And in this verse here, just like the Apostle Paul, he said we need to follow this. We need to follow godliness. What does godliness mean? God-like, loving, and kind, considerate of mankind, blesses man. Friends, we need, we need to take these traits and make our life richer. What kind of love do you have? Do you, love, do you love your fellow man? Do you love your wife or your husband or your children or your parents? Do you, do you love them? How much do you love the Lord? Would you put the Lord first above mother, father, children, grandparents, whoever it may be? Would you put, would you put the Lord above for, in front of them? Jesus Christ said if we don't love him more than we love all these others, what kind of love do we have? We can have the world's love. We can have love as the world looks at it. But do we have the kind of love that God looks at to make our life stronger every day? Are you a patient person? How many of you in here have patience? You know, sometimes we don't have the patience we need, do we? And we have to work on that. But he's told us here to follow after these things. But to fight, fight that good fight of faith. Don't ever, don't ever back up. You know, whenever, whenever an army is marching, whenever an army is told to go forward, they go forward. Anytime a man in a, as a soldier turns back, what's he called? He's called a traitor because he turns back away from God. Anytime in an army, a man that turns back is defeating himself. Friends, if you're marching for God, if you're God's child, don't ever quit marching forward. That's the only way we've got to go. There's nothing back there. Nothing back there in our past life that we need. Nothing back there to help us to march forward because we've got to turn it loose. We've got to move forward for Jesus Christ. You know, we live in a rough time, don't we? I hear a lot of talk about the rough time we live in. Let's look over to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2, or chapter 3, excuse me. We're going to look at a few verses in chapter 3. And I want you to notice what he says about the kind of world we live in. The kind of lives that people live. 2 Timothy, chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. 
He said, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. For just a minute, I want you to notice something that's in that list of those that are, that are against God in these perilous times. Disobedient to who? Disobedient to parents? You look in Romans chapter 1 and read about those in Rome and those that lived in that time, they were disobedient to parents too. And the thought of man that are probably likely in all the time in history of mankind, there have been those who have been disobedient to parents. And the Bible warns, the Bible warns you get about that. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Friends, we don't need these things to defeat us in our life. We don't need these things to put us down. So what is your attitude toward truth? What is your attitude toward the word of God? This completes this session of our attitude toward truth. And I encourage you to take the things we've studied, the things we've learned, and develop a good attitude. Develop a love for God unlike anything you've ever developed in your life. Allow God to be first with you in every move that you make. Because God will help you if you'll help yourself. Are there any questions or comments on tonight's lesson? <clears throat> anything at all? Nothing? You got elders in here. If you want to ask, they'll answer it. But now seriously, we understand and realize that in the course of our life, we all have questions sometimes. Don't let your questions go unanswered. Don't ever wonder about where I am and where I'm going and what I'm going to do when this life's finished. Don't ever wonder about if I'm prepared to go to heaven. Amos said in Amos chapter 4 and verse 12, Be prepared to meet thy God. Are we prepared to meet him? Are we ready? We can make that preparation if we'll have the attitude toward the truth that we allow truth to direct our steps. Will we allow it to direct our steps? Thank you very much tonight for your very kind attention. I hope I've said something to help you in, the, in your life. Something that will encourage you and strengthen you in the course of your days. But friends, get stronger. Stand strong. And like I said, don't, don't ever quit. Don't ever back up because there's nothing back there. We've got to serve God faithfully every single day but have a good attitude. A good attitude is sending a good outlook on life. A good attitude is sending a smile. A good attitude is sending a friendly gesture. A good attitude is seen when I'm marching forward for the cause of Christ. Don't ever quit marching. Thank you.